And now for our dinosaur of the day, Acrocanthosaurus, which coincidentally is, well, not coincidentally since we chose this dinosaur for the week, but it's the antagonist in Raptor Red. So Red, the Utah Raptor, has to kind of stay away from Acrocanthosaurus. Anyway, Acrocanthosaurus means high-spined lizard, and it's a theropod that lived in North America during the early Cretaceous. Its fossils have been found in Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming, and teeth have been found in Maryland. There's only one species, it's Acrocanthosaurus atokensis. J. Willis Stovall and Juan Langston Jr. named the species in 1950. Though the first fossils were discovered in the early 1940s, the holotype and paratype are partial skeletons and skulls from the antlers formation in Oklahoma. Acrocanthosaurus atokensis is named after Atoka County in Oklahoma, where the holotype was found. Another partial skeleton was found in 2012 in the Cloverleaf Formation in Wyoming, or Juvenile, and it may have been the only theropod in the Cloverleaf Formation. There's a tooth found in southern Arizona that's possibly Acrocanthosaurus, and teeth, again, found in the Arundel Formation in Maryland. In the 1990s, two more complete skeletons were described. From Texas, a partial skeleton without a skull, and from Oklahoma, a specimen found by Cephas Hall and Sid Love. And it was an even more complete skeleton that was nicknamed Fran, and is the largest and only known one with a complete skull and forelimb. So what happened is after finding a few pieces of the Acrocanthosaurus, Cephas Hall and Sid Love got permission to dig for the dinosaur. The land was owned by Firehauser, a timber and building materials company. And they got permission from the regional Timberlands manager, who said that the company had no interest in paleontological findings, but then once the company found out how valuable it was, after three to four years of excavating, they contested the ownership and it went to court. And this is the first time that two amateurs successfully excavated a major dinosaur quarry by themselves without financial or logistical support from a university or commercial fossil company. So that's pretty cool. It sounds kind of like the documentary Dinosaur 13 we talked about with the controversial contesting of an excavated dinosaur fossil once they found out it was valuable. Yeah, a little bit. This Acrocanthosaurus, Fran, ended up in the North Carolina Museum after the court battle when a, quote, mysterious donor gave millions of dollars to the museum to purchase the set of fossils for display. And there's a lot more detail in Russell Farrell's book, Acrocanthosaurus Bones of Contention, so we'll probably have to read that soon. Yeah, Sabrina and I actually saw that Acrocanthosaurus in the museum, and it's in a really cool display with a herbivore, and they're kind of in a little battle in this neat little domed roof area of the museum. Worth checking out. So again, the donor basically purchased this Acrocanthosaurus skeleton for $3 million in December of 1997 and then gave it to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And Black Hills Institute in South Dakota cleaned and prepared the bones. And it was because of this find of Fran that scientists realized Acrocanthosaurus was related to Allosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus. The bones of the North Carolina Museum's Acrocanthosaurus were jet black from minerals in the sediment. It also had a punctured shoulder blade and several heels, broken ribs. The Black Hills Institute said it was one of the most difficult preparations that they had done due to moss and pyrite on the bones, which released acids when removed, so the bones had to be prepared in vacuum boxes, or the preparers had to use respirators, which added many additional hours to the preparation. And again, in the North Carolina Museum of Sciences, the Acrocanthosaurus that you see is 54% of actual skeleton, it's not a replica. Sometimes Acrocanthosaurus is called Acro for short, and in the North Carolina Museum, they nicknamed their Acrocanthosaurus the Terror of the South. There are possible Acrocanthosaurus footprints in the Glen Rose Formation of Central Texas, though it's unclear for sure if it is. However, it's close to the Antlers and Twins Mountains formations, and it's from a similar time period during which the only theropod known from around then at that place was Acrocanthosaurus, so there's a good chance it is. The Glen Rose tracks were found in 1938, and American Museum of Natural History paleontologist Roland T. Bird studied them. One footprint seemed to skip a step. It had an overlapping footprint with a sauropod, so he thought that that meant the predator latched onto the sauropod prey with its teeth and maybe missed a step. Though this has been contested because the gait of the sauropod didn't change, so it seems unlikely that the sauropod would have just continued on its merry way after being bitten at. 
Bird excavated the trackway in 1940, and half of it's now in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, behind the Apatosaurus, and the other half is in the Texas Memorial Museum in Austin. If you look at the track on display in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, you can see that the theropod prints are on top of the sauropod tracks, which could suggest it stalked the sauropod herd since its print came after the sauropods, but it's unclear when these tracks were made. They could have been made as a group, or the dinosaurs could have just happened to go that route, but at different times. David Thomas, an artist, and James Farlow, a paleontologist, reconstructed the trackway, showing that the predator followed the sauropod very closely, made the same turns, and probably interacted. Also, right before the theropod skipped a step, the sauropod left a drag mark, so maybe it was attacked and faltered, or it threw its weight to avoid being bitten. But they're not sure if it was an attack, they just know that there is a missing track. However, trackways are very fragile. For example, the half of the trackway at the Texas Memorial Museum has already deteriorated since being on display. At one point it was thought maybe there was a second species of Acrocanthosaurus, when vertebrae with tall spines, similar to how Acrocanthosaurus has tall spines, from the early Cretaceous were found in England, and in 1988 Gregory S. Paul said that they were a second species called Acrocanthosaurus altispinax, which was later classified as a new genus called Beckelspinax. When it was first discovered, Acrocanthosaurus and other big theropods were only known from partial skeletons, which led to a lot of reclassifying. For a while, Acrocanthosaurus was part of Megalosauridae, which was a wastebasket taxon we talked about before, and some scientists also thought of it as a Spinosaurid until the 1980s because of the long spines. It was also considered part of the Allosauridae family, but now scientists mostly classify it as part of the Carcharodontosauridae family. And Carcharodontosaurids may have originated in Europe and dispersed into other continents at the time, called Gondwana. In 2011, paleontologists Drew R. Eddy and Julia A. Clark found in a study by comparing and contrasting anatomical features that Acrocanthosaurus shared a common ancestor with Allosaurus, but it does belong to the Carcharodontosaurid family. Acrocanthosaurus was one of the largest theropods at... 38 feet or 11.5 meters in length and weighing up to 6.2 tons. It was a typical large theropod but lived in the early Cretaceous, millions of years before other ones like T. rex or Gigantosaurus. It had a long skull about 4.5 feet or 1.4 meters long and had a lot of teeth. The upper jaw had 19 curved serrated teeth. May or may not be clear how many teeth are in the lower jaw, depending on who you ask. Some places I found that it had 68 teeth. Other places said the maxilla and premaxilla had 38 teeth. Like Allosaurids, Acrocanthosaurus had long, low ridges that ran on each side of its snout from the nostril to the eye. It had a typical Allosaurid skeleton, which is why it was classified as such for a while. It had a long, heavy tail to counterbalance, short forelimbs, three clawed digits on each hand. It was probably not a fast runner because its femur was longer than its tibia, which is the opposite of small fast running dinosaurs. It was probably an apex predator and preyed on sauropods, ornithopods, and chylosaurs. Its feet had four digits each, and the first digit was smaller than the rest and did not touch the ground. An analysis of an Acrocanthosaurus forelimb found that it probably had a lot of cartilage in its joints, like living archosaurs, and when resting, the forelimbs would hang from the shoulders, elbows bent, claws facing inwards, the humerus angled slightly backwards. It could not swing its arm in a circle, but it could swing it backwards, and it wouldn't have been able to completely straighten out its arm or even bend it much but it would be able to bend all its digits backwards so it could nearly touch the wrist. And the first digit of its hand had the biggest claw, it was permanently flexed. Because their forelimbs could not swing very far forward, it wouldn't have been able to scratch its own neck, and it probably used its mouth to hunt, but once it had prey in its jaws, it could have used its arms to hold the prey against its body and impale it with its claws. It may have also held prey in its jaws while slashing into it with its claws. Its eyes faced to the side, so it would have cocked its head to look at the prey. In 2005, scientists did a CT scan of a replica of an Acrocanthosaurus cranial cavity and found that it was most similar to Carcharodontosaurus and Gigantosaurus, which is a fellow Carcharodontosaurid. The brain was somewhat S-shaped, which is like a crocodile more so than a bird. It had large olfactory bulbs, so it had a good sense of smell. When resting, its head would have been looking downwards towards the ground, based on the CT scan about 25 degrees downward. Because Acrocanthosaurus was a large predator, it probably had a large range and lived in many different areas. Deinonychus also lived in the area, but it was a lot smaller, so not much competition. 
Acrocanthosaurus was a bipedal predator with notably the high neural spines, which probably supported muscle over its neck, back, and hips. These were 17 inch or 43 centimeter spines from its vertebrae on its back, neck, and tail. These spines were sometimes more than two and a half times the height of the vertebrae they came out of, though Spinosaurus had much higher spines. It's unclear exactly what the spines did, maybe it helped with communication, to store fat, or control temperature. So the spines may have been used for visual display as a sign of being healthy. If it stored fat, the, maybe the fatter they were, the healthier they were, and easier to track mates or something like that. Or it had different colors or markings. Or again, if it was bigger, it may have showed dominance that it was the better hunter, so it would win in a fight. Twin mountains and antlers formations where Acrocanthosaurus had been found were large floodplains that drained into a shallow inland sea in the early Cretaceous. The sea then expanded and became the Western Interior Seaway, which divided North America for most of the late Cretaceous. And Acrocanthosaurus, interestingly, is the state dinosaur of Oklahoma as of 2006, though Oklahoma already had a state fossil, Saurophaganax, which is a carnivore. So again, Acrocanthosaurus is a theropod, specifically a carnosaur in the family Carcharodontosauridae. Carnosaurs lived in the Jurassic and Cretaceous and includes allosaurs in their relatives, and they used to include a large array of theropods. One of the largest ones is Gigantosaurus, not to be confused with Gigantosaurus, which is a large sauropod. And these are some of the largest known predatory dinosaurs. Carnosaurs have large eyes and narrow skulls, and many carnosaurs were later classified as more primitive theropods, including megalosaurids, spinosaurids, and ceratosaurs.